to another episode of the Bear Down Podcast, joined today by the GOAT, Arizona softball retired head coach Mike Candrea, but still a Wildcat, still working here. Coach, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So there's a there's a lot we want to go into. Uh, obviously, your illustrious coaching career, what you're into now. So I want to start with just what has been like kind of post-retirement for you here over the summer, and I know you were with the uh, help in the Italian national team in the Olympics, but just what has life been like for you since retiring? Yeah, it's been good. You know, um, when we finished uh, at the World Series, I, I had um, told the Italian national team that uh, I would lend a hand um, trying to get them prepared for um, the Olympics and the European Championships. And that was really a compassion trip because I, I knew their uh, Enrico, um, their head coach for many years, and he passed away from COVID. And um, they just thought that the team needed a little bit of a boost. And so it was a great opportunity for me to go out and, and spend 35 days in Italy with uh, my wife and my brother-in-law and my sister, I brought them. And so we had a tremendous trip. I mean, just great people, um, great experience. Um, the, the, the players were fabulous to work with. And um, yeah, they won a the European championship. So that was a, a fun thing. Um, and then just been kind of doing a little bit of everything, you know, um, just got back from New York, uh, last week. And, um, again, it was, um, the theme was the Italians and, and, <laughs> um, we, we had a meeting with MLB to discuss the possibilities of softball, having a world softball classic and oh, alongside of the world baseball classic. And I think MLB is looking for some new things that could help. And uh, then I got to uh, attend a um, banquet uh, of the Italian um, American um, Baseball Foundation and um, got a chance to see 400 Italians uh, in a room. <laughs> and as you can um, expect, it was quite noisy, but um, some very, very neat um, tributes to some people, some uh, Italian Americans, and they raised money to to bring um, Italian um, players to the United States to attend college. So, yeah, I've been doing a little bit of, of everything. <laughs> well, uh, I want to get into the career, mm -hmm. the iconic career uh, of, of college softball. Uh, the numbers are there, eight national championships, all-time career wins later. We can go, we'll go to the Olympic part with Team USA later. But when you look back now, you've got the first national championship you won here, and the number eight. How do you look back at the differences between those now that you've had some time to, to retire, as it were? Well, I think the, the blessing that I had in my career was watching the game grow um, from, um, I remember my first day going to uh, our facility here at the University of Arizona and waiting for PE to get off the field so that we could practice and um, got on my three-wheeler and drug the field. I mean, I did a little bit of everything. And, and I think that's the one thing I kind of reflect back on is being able to actually live through um, the growth of um, college softball. And um, to me, it's been, I think, college softball right now is a missile ready to take off and a very exciting thing. And so in, in the early 90s, it was uh, basically trying to find a way to beat UCLA, you know, and trying to get into some homes of some very good players in Southern California and um, 91, um, I think was the team that kind of opened those doors for me because that team was primarily, um, Arizona athletes, um, with the spattering of some Southern Cal kids. And, uh, I think once we, um, won that championship, it kind of woke people up that, whoa, you know, these people are pretty serious. And it allowed me to get into some doors of the Jenny Daltons and Laura Espinosa's and, um, Nancy Evans. I mean, I can go on and on and on of all the great players that we've had. And so I look at it now and then I look at today um, completely different. I mean, with the um, the addition of the SEC, I think um, was really, there's two things that changed our game. I think number one was um, ESPN. And, um, you know, when we first started, they broadcast the championship game and that was it. And then with the growth of the sport, um, pretty soon they're broadcasting the regional games and super regional games and then every game at the College World Series. So to me, that was a treat to see um, how the sport was flourishing. Um, and um, 
you know, um, when the SEC got serious about softball and started putting money into facilities and um, and really putting some good programs together, I think that really kind of changed the whole complexion of our sport. Uh, and then the addition of social media. I mean, I don't think you can talk about the growth unless you talk about that. That's kind of changed some of the dynamics that I think uh, coaches today have to go through. And you touched on it just now. It's a good segue into what I think is a uh, maybe underrepresented part of your very multi-layered legacy here, which was the creation and building of Hill and Brand Stadium uh, ahead of the game when it came to facilities yeah. at the time. So when you're in 19, you know, early 1990s in the era of zero on-campus facilities, how did that idea come to fruition? Well, um, believe it or not, it was after uh, the 91 championship and I, we, were, we were flying home and Dick Barch, who uh, was my um, in charge of facilities then and was my traveling secretary, um, we sat down and, and actually drew a, um, a facility on a napkin. And it was kind of the very beginning of the vision of, you know, I think the sport, um, and especially here in Arizona, that if, if we could build something, that we could put people in the seats. And um, so I, I had kind of had that on a napkin. And then I remember in, it was a 93, maybe um, Bill Hellenbrand came in and said, Mike, I want to help the program. And I says, well, that's awesome. What do you want to do? And he goes, well, what do you have in mind? And I pulled out the napkin. I said, this is what I want. I, I want a facility. Was it your drawing or Dick Barton's drawing? It was something? Dick's, I think. Okay. Pretty much Dick was the, <laughs> you know how Dick was. Uh, but um, but I said, this is really what we, we would love to do. I think this would be a game changer, not only for Arizona softball, but for the sport. And um, he graciously came back and and uh, gave me a, a donation to build the first Hill and Brand Stadium that we had here. And it did. I mean, it was, it was the best of the best and the first on-campus facility for just fast pitch softball. And um, that served us very well. I mean, it. I think it was a big boost for us in, in recruiting and um, just kind of elevated um, the game of softball, you know, in the Pac-12 and then around the country. So that that was a, a, I mean, a big thing for us. What did it mean to you or what was going through your mind when you see that original stadium completed and you're playing, your, you're coaching your first game in there? It was awesome. I mean, it was absolutely um a dream come true, you know, uh, to actually have dugouts that were permanent dugouts, to to have a um, seating for fans and a press box. Although I look back now and it was, it was a, a it looked like a beer can up there, you know, <laughs> it wasn't much. Open air, it, open air, <laughs> you know. But it was it was everything that we wanted at that time. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it's like building any facility. You you build it and then you. A year from now, you look back, oh, God, I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd have done that. And so it was kind of good that I had a chance to to build um, what is Hill and Brand Stadium today. And and I can't be any prouder of of um, that facility and the work that was done by Concord uh, in a short period of time uh, to allow us to continue to practice there while they were building it. And I look at it today, and truthfully, Matt, it is everything um, that I could ask for, you know, I mean, I travel around the country. I've seen all the facilities that are available and I think Helen Brand has just its own uniqueness. Um, it's like going into Yankee stadium or Fenway park and, um, everything that we need, uh, and the upgrades for the fans, um, I think have just been a fabulous thing. And, and so I think it will serve as well, um, moving into the future. Um, uh, but I'm sure there'll be a time when we're going to want to have to do some other things to, keep up with the Joneses and uh, but I, I really believe that it 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 really forced some other programs to kind of look at what they had and and if we're going to grow this sport the way we want to grow it because uh, I think it can be a revenue producer um, then facilities is kind of where it starts. Now a staple of Hill and Brand both old and new soundtrack every game Linda Ronstadt <laughs> How did that come? How did that come to be, Coach? You know that that was probably a Duddleston thing. You know, <laughs> I you know he used to play some crazy music and and um, yeah, it just kind of has stuck with us. You know, I mean, I don't know. I had nothing to do with it, um, although I do like Linda Ronstead and 
was very familiar with it, but um, it just became a staple. And um, even today, so it's, it's it, you know, that's one of the neat things I love about this program. It's just a tradition that we built. And that's one of the traditions, you know, and it just kind of happened that way. It's a nice uh, addition of kind of a Tucson flavor yeah, is the way I like it. Absolutely. And it's it's uh, something that always brings a smile to not only my face, but everybody who's at a game when it, when it finally rings out there and it gets queued up. Um, but when you look back at your career and you look back at all you accomplished, the construction of two facilities, what do you think you can point to as this is what – this is a part of my coaching philosophy or coaching, you know, tool bag that was the most successful. What, what made you be the coach that you grew and developed into? What was the tool or, or just the personality trait? Well, I think the biggest thing was um, I, I've always known that it would take a village to do what we wanted to do. And so I'm a people person. And I think the one thing that I'm proud of is I, I always treated people very well. And not just the athletes, but but the people that work for us. And um, to me, that was very important to me, you know, to make everyone feel like they're a part of the program. And so um, I look back now, and that's probably the one thing that I'm most proud of is, number one, that I don't think I've changed as a person from my first day at Central Arizona College to, to right now. You know, I, I love people. Um, I, I love the game. Um, and... You know, to, to be successful at this level, I think you have to be a people person. You've got to be able to bring in athletes. Um, and we always sold family. You know, I mean, I'm a family man and, and always have been that way. And I really feel like when you're recruiting young women, um, it's pretty important for those parents to know that their young lady is going to be taken care of. And, um, and like I always told them, it's, you know, my job was to prepare them for life after softball. Uh, more than anything. So it was, it was a culture and to build a culture today, I think, you know, you hear culture all the time, but um, building a culture that, that um, sustains itself over a long period of time, I think is the special part. You know, if you're changing your culture every year, then you probably have issues. Um, I think people knew when they came to Arizona, what it was going to be like, what to expect. And um, to me, I think that's, one of my greatest prides in my career was to, to be able to build cultures that were built around excellence, but more importantly, built around family and making sure that a kid knew that um, it wasn't that I just wanted them to be a great athlete, but I wanted them to be a great person. And, you know, I building that culture, the one thing that, that kind of stands out to me is just is trying to find high character kids. And um, we were very fortunate to bring in some really good athletes, but they were also really good people. And you've, you've mentioned this before. It was, uh, in your words, coaching them beyond their four years, coaching them beyond their careers. And one staple of, I think, that culture that you just mentioned is you have a routine where you text every one of your players on their birthday. What does that calendar look like? Do you have that written down? Oh, yeah, I do. Is it in a, a handwritten calendar? You can walk into my office any day and look at my planner, and it's got every kid's birthday on it every day. I mean, it's the first thing I do when I get up is I look at that thing, and I, you know, that's the good thing about text messages because, <laughs> you know, when I started coaching, um, you know, we didn't have cell phones, so you had to actually call someone. And um, so that's one of the blessings of text messaging is I can – stay in touch pretty easily. And I got that really, that idea. I mean, it, it's not my own idea, but I, I got it from um, um, Mississippi State, um, Ron Polk. And um, my brother-in-law played for Ron Polk. And Mike said one time, he goes, you know, the thing that amazes me about Ron Polk is he never misses a birthday that I have or a... Um, anniversary of my marriage and I thought you know that's pretty special and um, so back in the day I started doing it and um, even today I take a lot of pride in that. Now uh, there was a, a lot of I think iconic moments and maybe picturesque moments that have kind of hallmarked your your career. Um, I think of back to just more recently 
Deja Mula pull up coming back with Team USA. The first year Hill and Brand and the big hug at home played. Um, the the post game celebration of last season winning the Super Regional, punching the ticket home to OKC, and then of course OKC. Uh, but that final moment on ESPN after the the World, Women's College World Series, you're in the dugout. You said later that you didn't know the cameras were on right. you. It was a very peaceful moment of yeah. pulling the lineup guard and, and walking out. What was that moment like? Just knowing that that was the end. Then, yeah, you know, I it was pretty surreal. I mean, when when I got to the World Series, um, Jess Mendoza and Holly Rowe, and they were all kind of, you know, trying to get me to to announce my retirement, and and um, or they had a feeling that it was coming close to that, and. I just wanted to do it on my own time and, and wanted to enjoy that last experience. I knew going in that that was going to be my last um, trip to Oklahoma City and, and that was going to be my finale. And, and so it was, um, yeah, it was just one of those moments you just, I, I wanted to absorb everything. I wish it ended on a, on a national championship. Um, yeah. Cause that's one of the things I always loved when we won, people always said, well, God, you're never, Jumping out of the dugout and jumping on the you know the the crowd at at, uh, at the pitching circle, you're always kind of sitting there and watching it. And that was one of the things I love to do is just watch the celebration and the culmination of all that hard work and and um, to be able to just sit there and and enjoy that these young people you know set a goal and, and reach that goal. And and to me that was probably my final moment of knowing that I, you know, I've, I've been in love with my career forever and have had a passion for what I do. I never, ever looked at it as going to work every day. It was, it was an honor to, to represent this university and, and the people in Tucson. And, and that was kind of my moment to say, God, it's, it's here. And, you know, I never thought that 47 years would go by so quickly. <laughs> and I still have to remind myself, it just, it, it's, unbelievable how quick it has gone. I mean, I can remember, you know, George Young talking me into going into softball. And um, it just seems like it was not too long ago. And, um, you know, when you start in a career, you you thank God you're never going to see the end of the tunnel. But I tell you what, it goes by very quickly. And, and I think toward the end of my career, I really started to enjoy the moments because I wasn't really good at that. I mean, I would blow through victories. I would agonize over defeats. Um, I, I did never uh, celebrated the little victories. And I think later on in my career, I just realized that every day was kind of a special day. And I think that comes from, you know, being here and losing a player at 21 years old, uh, Julie Raytan. I mean, that, that really kind of changed my life when that occurred, um, that I was going to make sure that I enjoyed every day. And, um, you know, the curveballs that I've been through in my own life, um, losing my wife in, in 2004, you know, you, you just sometimes take a lot of things for granted. And, and, um, and today I really don't. And I caught myself one day sitting in my office and um, pulled out this tape measure, you know, and it, I've had it for like everything else in my office forever. And, <laughs> um, and um, for some reason I was thinking about my dad. My dad passed away at 77 and I took this tape measure out and threw out 77 inches and I took away the 65 that I was at that time. I go, that's what I got left. And so I think as you get older, you are a little more melancholy about time and how quickly time goes by. And I'm at that stage in my life when I've lost a lot of good friends. I mean, you know, when I, you know, Lute Olson and, and Jerry Kendall and Dick Tomey and, 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 you know, people that were just really instrumental in, in, who I am and, and how I coached. Um, I had some great mentors along the way and and I've been very blessed. And so now I want to try to be that same person to others, you know, and and I think that's kind of my role right now. It's not to tell them how to coach, but but really to be there for them because it, it is when you're when you're in the battle, um, it's sometimes hard to to understand how important balance is. Um, and, and I wasn't very good at that. You know, um, today I just got, I had a meeting this morning and um, got a tremendous honor as a father of the year, which I, um, I, I kind of told them, you know, I, I really feel like I wasn't a really good father because it's hard 
when you're coaching, you spend more time with other people's kids than your own kids, you know? And, um, but it's, it, it's, I think those challenges that have, that hopefully that I can bring to other coaches, young coaches that really don't see the big picture, you know, and I did, not I mean, I thought my life revolved around winning a championship and um, I realized, man, I'm, I'm missing some of the most important things. And that was my own family, my own kids. When you look back and, and you look at how your legacy played out and the memories and, and everything that brought a smile to your face, your time with the Olympics, your time at the Olympics in Team USA, was that a different type of fulfillment for you? Was that a different type of experience for, for your coaching career? Yeah. I, you know, I think you don't really understand it until you're, you're in the Olympic arena and um, you listen to the national anthem on foreign soil and you're representing something, com- I mean, much bigger than yourself and or your state. Um, it's you're representing the country, you know. And to me, that was um, just a real valuable experience for me to be able to to travel abroad. I, I, I mean, it, it took me to places I would have never have gone to, um, but to, to be able to coach the very best and um, and, and to accept the challenge of, you know, it's. You either win a gold medal or you're it's you feel like a failure, you know. And and in 2004, um, through a lot of trials and tribulations, we dominated the world and brought home gold. And then in 2008, you know, we a very good team. I lost one game in the world in the Olympic Games that happened to be my last one. Mm-hmm. And you know, the silver medal, you, you should be happy about that. Uh, but for some reason, it was like the job wasn't complete. And so that's the one thing that I, I, I have a tough time when I start talking about the Olympics and, and my experiences there was, it, it just felt like I, I, I couldn't finish it the way I wanted to. And there were some memorable stories along the way for those Olympic tours. Uh, a game in the Dominican, I believe, yeah. which uh, was a, a stadium setting that you had never seen before. Yeah. Well, you know, I always took pride in, in, in preparation. And, and um, so I remember going, going to the Dominican and we, we arrive at the field and they're still putting up the backstop. They haven't even finished building the damn place. But I, I remember having this great game plan for practice that day. And I go, can you tell me where the practice field is? And the lady points to my right and I look over to my right and all I see is this pasture. <laughs> and she says, yeah, that's, that's where, you know, you can practice. And so we walk over there and I look at it, man, the grass is about up to my knees and, and there's a couple of bare spots. So I'm thinking to myself, I look at this practice plan, I kind of ripped it up. I go, this ain't going to work. So we, we found a couple of patches that we could throw in and hit in. And the only issue I had was there was this donkey in left field. And I figured I didn't want to start an international incident by <laughs> nailing the donkey, you know, hitting, taking batting practice. And so we had one of the stations was protecting the donkey. So we had, we had a couple of kids with their gloves on protecting the donkeys while we kind of took BP. And I think internationally, that's kind of what it taught me was number one, you have to be flexible, but um, number two is you always expect the worst, you know, because it, it, it was never as planned. And so um, I had to learn how to adapt and, and um, that became a very valuable thing for me because when I came back to the United States, I. Number one, I always wanted to kiss the ground, and and um, but number two, never complained about a field. You know the things that we played on, and the things that these young ladies get to play on are completely different. Now, as we transition in your career, you're you're moving into a new chapter yeah. of it, um, a, a coaching development lead now, uh, a coach's coach, as it were, but. That's something you've always had a passion for. I think back to your clinic yeah. days, right? Yeah. Of, of hey. If anybody wants to call me about whether you're a JUCO softball coach or a Division three baseball coach about that, I'm always here for you. When did that sort of passion in you to help other coaches do you think kind of arrived? Well, I think it, it was my baseball background. You know, uh, one thing about baseball coaches is that there's no secrets. And, and, and they were always very good at, at sitting around and, and uh, having a cold beverage and talking the game. We were always talking the game. And that's kind of how I learned Um the game, you know, um, I had my ideas on how I did things, but, but truthfully, I always was trying to get in the back pocket of, of successful coaches and trying to figure out what made them successful. And, 
many times it's we're all teaching the same thing, but it, it could be different verbiage. It could be a different approach. And um, I, I kind of brought that to softball because when I first got into softball, I noticed that, man, everyone kind of held their cards close to their chest and they want to ask you questions or talk. And so I started clinics and um, I think coaches were very um, surprised how open I was to talking about the things that we did and how we did it. And um, that's kind of, um, I think one of the things I'm proud of is that I think one of our jobs is to grow the sport. And part of that is sharing information. And um, I think the kids today are better because they're getting better information at an earlier age than the kids were 25 years ago. And um, so I, I've always loved to do clinics. I'm, in fact, I'm still doing those type of things. Um, but um, I think that's really what's helped grow our sport. It's, you know, information is power. And if I can help any, you know, I mean, coaching is coaching. And I, I really believe a lot of it is just managing people, um, you know, building cultures, um, being a good leader. And I think you can take those staples and go to any sport and you're going to see the successful people are the ones that are able to manage people, to be able to build cultures of excellence, um, to hold people accountable, um, and to set standards. You know, I think that's the toughest part is, you know, every time I did something, I always thought about the 500 players that I've coached, never wanted to let them down. And so you're, you're really in uniform 24 seven. And for some people that's a little too much. Um, but for me, I took pride in that because I, the last thing I ever wanted to do was disappoint one of the players that I've ever coached. And so making decisions sometimes in life is the most difficult thing. And for me to, to know that this is a career that I truly fell in love with, I never wanted to do anything to disrupt that career. And, and so I think a lot of times it's the simple things. It, it, it is about um, taking care of your village and managing people and, and holding people accountable can be very difficult. But the other thing is you gotta hold yourself accountable too. Because the one thing that I've always wanted to do is bring stability to young kids. And I really, and that's one thing I look at when I hire people is, do they have stability in their own life in order to bring stability into these young kids' lives that they're leading, I think is very important. And if you don't have that, it doesn't work. Now you, in this new position you've got, and it's a tremendous resource for the whole athletic department, coach of any sport, you still have your open door, open, yeah. open phone policy. When you're, and I know you've been watching, you've been at football games, at basketball games, in this current role you have, in the current mindset where you're no longer actively coaching, mm -hmm. do you watch games differently? Do you see it differently now? Um, you know, I'm an Arizona fan. And, and so, um, I mean, I watch every game that that's on TV and, and, you know, with, like the other day I was watching our basketball team play and, and, um, and you can't really watch the bench much, but I, I catch myself watching the bench and the interaction and, um, you know, who, who, who's leading on, on, on the court or on the field and, and um, are they having fun? I mean, I think that's the one thing that you see. You can, you can pretty much tell when kids are engaged and, and, um, and the culture is good because they look like they're having fun, you know? and. And so I, yeah, I, I have a tendency to, like, like in football, I, I watch the sidelines a lot more than I, I normally did. Uh, but it's not that I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying to, you know, point something out or anything like that. I just, I, this is the first time I've been able to go out and watch other practices. And so to me, it's a treat to go watch Augie and swimming and watch gymnastics and watch football and watch baseball because I never had that opportunity. And so Part of it is learning. I mean, part of it, I love watching other people do their their job, you know, and especially people that are really good at it. You know, it's it's fun to watch. Um, but on the other hand, if I can help in any way of of being there for them, and and I've got an old saying, you know, when when the student arrives, the teacher can appear. Mm -hmm. So I, I I don't feel like it's my job to force the issue, but um, I just want to want them to know that I'm here, and and I want to bounce around and just jump into offices and see how people are doing. And I think that's an important part because um, the, the culture of athletics today, you know, Dave and, 
and the administration, it's just, it's so different um, than it was, you know, back in the day. And, and I understand it. I mean, they, they've got a lot of things on their plate and sometimes they can't even get out of their office. And so it's kind of fun for me to be able to roam the halls and talk to people and see how they're doing. And then, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to be able to help um, um, Dave in any way I can to, to bring back feedback that I see that and from a coach's viewpoint, I think sometimes when they're having meetings administratively, um, most of them understand sport and they're, they played it or some have coached it, but it's, it's, it's a different view, you know, when, and, and, and for me, it's, you know, hopefully I can maybe be a voice for the coaches to, to give them some different feedback on, on issues and things that they're thinking about. Big question here, coach, Yeah. the golf game. Post retirement, outstanding. How is it coming along? Is it playing all right now? Outstanding. I mean, it. You know, that's the one thing I was looking forward to is being able to actually play the game. I haven't really played it as much as I like. When I go to Pine Top, I play every day, and um, that was a good thing from COVID because we couldn't do anything other than play golf. Um, but now I'm not playing as much as I wish I could. Um, but I, I. I do have um, a, a new set of clubs. I just got some Ping 425s that have kind of changed the game a little <laughs> bit for me. Um, but yeah, my handicap has definitely gone down. Um, I love the the challenge of golf, uh, the, the mental aspect of it. And um, I want to be good at it. I don't know if I'll ever be as good as I want to be, but um, I, I, I love it. You know, I, I really do. It is one of my passions. It's the pursuit and the strive to be better. That's what the game of golf is. And I think it's probably some parallels to coaching softball, yeah. whether it's hitting or, or having a, a good defensive player. I've always, I've always said, you know, when I took when I took this job, there's two people I really want to get get a chance to know really well and be in my corner. One was the maintenance guys that took care of our field, and the other one was the golf coaches. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jimbo and Laura, you know, I, I visit them quite a bit, and then Rick LaRose is like a brother to me, and and um, um, it, yeah, it's been it's been fun. So we're going to look ahead now, Coach, the 2022 softball season. It'll be a different different yeah. season for you, but, you know, watching and not coaching. Um, and obviously the news that you, 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 your former player, Caitlin Lowe, is taking over the program. As her coach and as somebody who coached her as a player and as a member of your staff, what did you see in Caitlin and when did you see it to know she was going to be that good of a coach? Well, Caitlin's a winner. Um, she's... Um, she has displayed excellence in every level that she's ever been in from travel ball when I was recruiting her to, to um, college softball, to the pro league, to the Olympic games. Um, she's one of those kids that, that played the game at a very high level, um, was a great teammate uh, and was a great leader. And um, there was no doubt that I, I, I felt after last year that she was the one because um, she, she's a great communicator. She's a, a good leader. Um, she's been good at everything that she's done. So I don't see, I see the, the program even getting better because she's so well connected to some things that I was losing <laughs> connection with, you know, I mean, social media is a big part of it right now. And, and um, I remember when we started recruiting seventh and eighth graders, I was, I would be, I was, I'd go crazy at night when I get a call from a seventh grader. I'm going, what am I going to talk to them about? You know, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, she's just, um, she's phenomenal. And um, I got a chance to watch them in the fall and the culture is really good. Um, you know, Caitlin um, understands the game. She understands people um, and she understands winning. And so there's no doubt in my mind that this program will continue. And that's really what I wanted is to make sure that it, the program would be in good hands and there's no doubt I go to bed at night knowing it's in great hands. And the one thing I learned um, watching the fall games, quite interesting and probably not what you're thinking <laughs> is um, as I was sitting there watching the game, I would scan the, um, the stands, which I never get a chance to do when I'm coaching. And one thing I noticed that 90% um, of them are on their phones, you know, and, and I know one of the challenges moving forward is going to be um, with, the new TV contracts and, 
And now I know why that digital format is, is so important because people want to see snippets of the games. They don't want to sit there and watch a whole game. But I thought that was kind of shocking that, wow, you know, what are they doing? Are they texting people? Are they yeah, live stats? Some of yeah, the live stats yeah. and watch other games, you know. So I learned a little bit from sitting there watching it. But I, I enjoy watching it. I enjoy this team because um, obviously I uh, have coached most of these kids and um, – the one thing that I can say about this program is they're, they're, we have some really good athletes, but really some tremendous people. So besides the observation you made watching fall, how do you think it's going to go? How do you think it's going to be for you watching games mm -hmm. when the score counts mm -hmm. come Pac-12 season for that first time? You know, Matt, truthfully, it's going to be just fine because I'm, um, I'm very, very comfortable with where I'm at right now. I mean, the time was right. Um, I did it on my own terms because I knew. Um, um, I, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, I, I, I love supporting and I love watching. Um, I, I can't tell you how it's going to be when we start playing conference games. And I'm sure there's going to be some things I might see that I'm going, ah, why are we doing that? Or, <laughs> or you know, I hope I'm not that person. But um, I just, I, I love supporting um people that I truly love. And I love every one of those kids that are on that field. And I love this coaching staff. Uh, Lauren Lappin, you know, played for me in the Olympic games and Taryn. And I mean, it's, it's easy, you know? And so I, I know they're going to have a good year and uh, we all know about this game. You got to pitch, pitch well to get where you want to go. And, and um, I think they're, they've got a good opportunity to be, um, be very good this year and was very impressed this fall. Well, I know all the fans are excited to watch the watch the season coming up. We're all counting down the days for it. February will be here before we know it. It's right around the corner. And uh, in the meantime, fans can catch you at a at a basketball game or throughout yeah. McHale. Now that you're uh, spending a little more time in the hallways of McHale. So. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's it's kind of fun being a spectator, um, but um, I'm enjoying life right now, being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and and um, do some different things, you know. Um, as, as a young, uh, probably 20 years ago, I, I thought I wanted to be an athletic director and get an administration and I'm glad I never did, uh, cause coaching is a lot more fun, you know, <laughs> but this has kind of given me a chance to, to look at the big picture and, and, you know, I, I, I love this program. I love this university and anything that Dave wants me to do and that I can do to help, um, uh, I'm there, you know, I mean, one of the neatest things I did so far this fall is I, um, Bobby Robbins reached out to me and all the tribal leaders were getting together in Maricopa and he wanted me to go speak to them. And um, I, I had a wonderful day with getting out of my box and doing something different. So I'm hoping that those uh, new experiences will keep coming and and uh, I'm looking forward to the future. Just got to stay healthy. Big thing. That's always the big thing. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Coach. Very much appreciate it. And, uh, Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Bear Down Podcast and uh, the coach's coach now, Coach Candrea, roaming the halls of McHale Center.